Radio, the talk show podcast station, bringing you daily health and information, where daily health is viewed as an ever-changing reality. Thank you for t- taking the time to tune in. This is Daily Health. Now, all information and resources are based on your views as a host, unless otherwise noted. All information is intended to motivate, encourage, and inspire your positive change and a healthier lifestyle. This podcast contains quotations, images, and or excerpts from copyrighted materials. These uses fall well within the copyright doctrine of fair use. Welcome. Welcome to my new listeners and my day ones. Hopefully you all are having a good morning thus far. Hopefully it will be a blessed and productive day. This is Let's Talk's Daily Health. Now today we are talking about HIV. And this is a subject that we still have a lot of people who do not want to talk about this subject. They kind of just disregard it. And for some people, it's a normal subject. And they just really don't... They t- they kind of talk about it, but don't really talk about it. You know what I mean? Um, and with so much misinformation going around, which can lead to more people getting this deadly disease because it can be deadly if it's contracted and nothing is done to deal with the symptoms which can lead to those deadly other diseases that are considered complications of HIV so we're going to talk about it today what it is what can happen if it goes untreated, how you contract it. So we can kind of get rid of those myths and misinformation. So what is HIV? HIV is a virus that damages the immune system. Untreated HIV affects and kills CD4 cells, which are a type of immune cells called T cells. Over time, as HIV kills more CD4 cells, The body is more likely to get various types of conditions and cancers. So we're discussing now, how is HIV transmitted? Well, it's transmitted through bodily fluids that include blood, semen, vaginal and rectal rectal fluids, and even breast milk. The virus isn't transferred in air or water or through casual contact. Because HIV inserts itself into the DNA of cells, it's a lifelong condition and currently there are no drugs that eliminates HIV from the body. Although many scientists are working day and night to find one. However, with medical care including treatment called antiviral therapy, it's possible to manage HIV and live with the virus for many years. Though without treatment, a person with HIV is likely to develop a serious condition called the Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome, known as AIDS. At that point, the immune system is too weak to successfully respond against other diseases, infections, and conditions. Untreated, life expectancy with end-stage AIDS is about three years. With antiviral therapy, HIV can be well managed and life expectancy can be nearly the same as someone who has not contracted HIV. It's estimated that 1.2 million Americans are currently living with HIV. Of those people, 1 in 7 don't know they have the virus. HIV can cause changes throughout the body. So, what exactly is AIDS? It's a lot of controversy between what HIV and what AIDS are. So, AIDS is a disease that can develop in people with HIV. 
it's the most advanced stage of HIV. But just because a person has HIV doesn't mean AIDS will develop. HIV kills CD4 cells. Healthy adults generally have a CD4 count of 500 to 1600 per cubic millimeter. A person with HIV whose CD4 count falls below 200 per cubic millimeter will be diagnosed with AIDS. A person can also be diagnosed with AIDS if they have HIV and develop an opportunistic infection or cancer that's rare in people who don't have HIV. An opportunistic infection such as pneumocystis, gerophosite, I might have messed that name up, but please forgive me, pneumonia, is one that only occurs in a severely immunocompromised compromised person, such as someone with advanced HIV infection, AIDS. Untreated HIV can progress to AIDS within a decade there's currently no cure for AIDS, and without treatment, life expectancy after diagnosis is about three years. This may be shorter if the person develops a severe opportunistic illness. However, treatment with antiviral drugs can prevent AIDS from developing. Should AIDS develop, it means that the immune system is severely compromised. That is weakened to the point where it can no longer successfully respond against most diseases and infections. That makes the person living with AIDS vulnerable to a wide range of illnesses, which include, but are not limited to, pneumonia, tuberculosis, oral thrush, which is a fungal condition in the mouth or throat, CMV, cytomegalovirus, see I, bet you, I butchered another one, my fault, which is a type of herpes virus, cryptococcal meningitis, a fungal condition in the brain, taxoplasmosis, a brain condition caused by a parasite, Crypto sauridosis, a condition caused by an intestinal parasite. Cancer, including Kaposi sarcoma, KS for short, and lymphoma. The shortened life expectancy linked with untreated AIDS isn't a direct result of the syndrome itself. Rather, it's a result of the disease and complications that arise from having an immune system weakened by AIDS. HIV and AIDS. So what's the connection? To develop AIDS, a person has to have contracted HIV. But having HIV doesn't necessarily mean that person will develop AIDS. Mm -hmm. Cases of HIV progress through three stages. Stage one, which is the acute stage. The first few weeks after transmission. Stage two, clinical latency or chronic stage. Stage three, AIDS. As HIV lowers the CD4 cell count, the immune system weakens. A typical adult CD4 count is 500 to 1500 per cubic millimeter. A person with a count below 200 is considered to have AIDS. How quickly a case of HIV progresses through the chronic stage varies significantly from person to person. Without treatment, it can last up to a decade before advancing to AIDS. With treatment, it can last indefinitely. Along those same lines, there is technically no cure for AIDS currently. However, treatment can increase a person's CD4 count to the point where they're considered to no longer have AIDS. This point is a count of 200 or higher. 
Also, treatment can typically help manage opportunistic infections. HIV and AIDS are related, but they're not the same thing. HIV transmission, we must know the facts. Anyone can contract HIV. The virus is transmitted in bodily fluids that include blood, semen, vaginal and rectal fluid, as well as breast milk. Some of the ways HIV is transferred from person to person include through vaginal or anal sex, the most common route of transmission by sharing needles, syringes, and other items for injection drug use, by sharing tattoo equipment without sterilizing it between uses, during pregnancy, labor, or delivery from a pregnant person to their baby, during breastfeeding, through premastication or chewing a baby's food before feeding it to them, through exposure to the blood, semen, vaginal, and rectal fluids, and breast milk of someone living with HIV, such as through a needle stick. The virus can also be transmitted through a blood transfusion or organ and tissue transplant. However, rigorous testing for HIV among blood, organ, and tissue donors ensures that this is very rare in the United States. Although theoretically possible, but considered extremely rare, for HIV to be transmitted through oral sex only if there are bleeding gums or open sores in the person's mouth. Being bitten by a person with HIV only if the saliva is bloody or there are open sores in the person's mouth. Contact between broken skin, wounds, or mucous membranes and the blood of someone living with HIV. Now, to rid these this misinformation and myths, HIV does not, I repeat, HIV does not transfer through skin-to-skin -skin contact, hugging, shaking hands, or kissing, air or water, sharing food or drinks, including drinking fountains, saliva, tears, or sweat unless mixed with the blood of a person with HIV, sharing a toilet, towels, or bedding, mosquitoes, or other insects. It is important to note that if a person living with HIV is being treated and has a persistently undetectable viral load, it's virtually impossible to transmit the virus to another person. So what are the causes of HIV? HIV is a variation of a virus that can be transmitted to African chimpanzees. Scientists suspect the simian immunodeficiency virus jumped from chimps to human when people consumed chimpanzee meat containing the virus. Once inside the human population, the virus mutated into what we now know as HIV. Now this likely occurred as long ago as in the 1920s. So this has been around for some years. HIV spread from person to person throughout Africa over the course of several decades. Eventually the virus migrated to other parts of the world. Scientists first discovered HIV in the human blood sample in 1959. It's thought that HIV has existed in the United States since the 1970s, but it didn't start to hit public consciousness until the 1980s. So during the 1970s, in the era of free love, was more than likely a boom situation. Because in the 1970s, they a lot of people went through the phase of free love and they didn't exactly wear protection. 
as much as it's advertised and promoted to do so now. So, what are the causes of AIDS? AIDS is caused by HIV. A person can't get AIDS if they haven't contracted HIV. Healthy individuals have a CD4 count of 500 to 1500 per cubic millimeter. Without treatment, HIV continues to multiply and destroy CD4 cells. If a person's CD4 count falls below 200, they have AIDS. Also, if someone with HIV develops an opportunistic infection associated with HIV, they can still be diagnosed with AIDS, even if their CD4 count is above 200. So, what are the tests used to diagnose HIV? There are several different tests that can be used to diagnose HIV. Healthcare providers determine which test is best for each person. Antibody, anti-gene anti tests are the most commonly used tests. They can show positive results typically within 18 to 45 days after someone initially contacts, contracts HIV. These tests check the blood for antibodies and antigens. An antibody is a type of protein the body makes to respond to an infection. An antigen, on the other hand, is the part of the virus that activates the immune system. Antibody tests. These tests check the blood solely for antibodies. Between 23 and 90 days after transmission, most people will develop detectable HIV antibodies, which can be found in the blood or saliva. These tests are done using blood tests or mouth swabs, and there is no preparation necessary. Some tests provide results in 30 minutes or less and can be performed in a healthcare provider's office or clinic. Other antibody tests can be done at home. Or a quick HIV test, an oral swab provides results in as little as 20 minutes. Home access HIV-1 test system. After the person pricks their finger, they send a blood sample to a licensed laboratory. They can remain anonymous and call for results the next business day. If someone suspects they've been exposed to HIV but tested negative in a home test, they should repeat the test in three months. If they have a positive result, they should follow up with their healthcare provider to confirm. Nucleic acid test, or NAT for short. This expensive test isn't used for general screening. It's for people who have early symptoms of HIV or have a known risk factor. This test doesn't look for antibodies. It looks for the virus itself. It takes from 5 to 21 days for HIV to be detectable in the blood. This test is usually accompanied or confirmed by an antibody test. Today, it's easier than ever to get tested for HIV. So, what is the HIV window period? Well, as soon as someone contracts HIV, it starts to reproduce in their body. The person's immune system reacts to the antigens, which is part of the virus, by producing antibodies, which are cells that take countermeasures against the virus. The time between exposure to HIV and when it becomes detectable in the blood is called the HIV window period. Most people develop detectable HIV antibodies within 23 to 90 days after transmission. If a person takes an HIV test during the window period, it's likely they'll receive a negative result. However, they can still transmit the virus to others during this time. If someone thinks they may have been exposed to HIV but tested negative during this time, 
they should repeat the test in a few months to confirm. Now, the timing depends on the test used. And during that time, they need to use condoms or other barrier methods to prevent possibly spreading HIV. Someone who tests negative during the window might benefit from post-exposure prophylaxis, PEP for short. This is medication taken after an exposure to prevent getting HIV. PEP needs to be taken as soon as possible after the exposure. It should be taken no later than 72 hours after exposure, but ideally before then. Another way to prevent getting HIV is pre-exposure prophylaxis, excuse me, PREP, which is a combination of HIV drugs taken before potential exposure to HIV. PrEP can lower the risk of contracting or transmitting HIV when taken consistently. Timing is important when testing for HIV. So it begs the question, what are the symptoms and are there any early symptoms? Yes, there are. The first few weeks after someone contracts HIV is called the acute infection stage. During this time, the virus reproduces rapidly. The person's immune system responds by producing HIV antibodies, which are proteins that take measures to respond against infections. During this stage, some people have no symptoms at first. However, many people experience symptoms in the first month or so after contracting the virus, but they often don't realize HIV causes those symptoms. So how is this? Well, this is because symptoms of the acute stage can be very familiar to those of the flu or other seasonal viruses such as they may be mild to severe, they may come and go, they may last anywhere from a few days to several weeks. So early symptoms of HIV can include fever, chills, swollen lymph nodes, general aches and pains, skin rash, sore throat, headache, nausea, and upset stomach. Because these symptoms are similar to common illnesses like the flu, the person who has them might not think they need to see a health care provider. And even if they do, their health care provider might suspect the flu or mononucleosis and might not even consider HIV. So it's very important that you get tested. Whether a person has symptoms or not, during this period, their viral load is very high. The viral load is the amount of HIV found in the bloodstream. A high viral load means that HIV can be easily transmitted to someone else during this time. Initial HIV symptoms usually resolve within a few months as the person enters the chronic or clinical latency stage of HIV. This stage can last many years or even decades with treatment. HIV symptoms can vary from person to person. After the first month or so, HIV enters the clinical latency stage. This stage can last from a few years to a few decades. And for some people, they don't have any symptoms during this time, while others may have minimal or nonspecific symptoms. A nonspecific symptom is a symptom that doesn't pertain to one specific disease or condition. These nonspecific symptoms may include headaches and other aches and pains, swollen lymph nodes, recurrent fevers, night sweats, fatigue, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, weight loss, skin rashes, recurrent oral or vaginal yeast infections, pneumonia, and even shingles. 
And as with the early stage, HIV is still transferable during this time, even without symptoms and can be transmitted to another person. A person won't know they have HIV unless they get tested. If someone has these symptoms and thinks they may have been exposed to HIV, it is very important that they get tested. HIV symptoms at this stage may come and go or they may progress rapidly. This progression can be slow with treatment. With the consistent use of this antiviral therapy, chronic HIV can last for decades and will likely not develop into AIDS. That is, if treatment was started early enough. So is a rash a symptom of HIV? Many people with HIV experience changes to their skin. Rash is often one of the first symptoms of an HIV infection. Generally, an HIV rash appears as multiple small red lesions that are flat and raised. HIV makes someone more susceptible to skin problems, and that's because the virus destroys immune system cells that take measures against infection. Co-infections that can cause rash include herpes simplex, shingles, and molluscum contagiosum. The cause of the rash determines how it looks, how long it lasts, how it can be treated depends on the cause. Rash related to medication. Well, while rash can be caused by HIV co-infections, it can also be caused by medication. Some drugs used to treat HIV or other conditions can cause a rash. This type of rash usually appears within a week or two weeks after starting a new medication. Sometimes the rash will clear up on its own. If it doesn't, a change in medication may be needed. Rash due to an allergic reaction to medication can be serious. Other symptoms of an allergic reaction include trouble breathing or swallowing, dizziness, and even fever. Stevens-Johnson syndrome, or SJS for short, is a rare allergic reaction to HIV medication. Symptoms include fever and swelling of the face and tongue. A blistering rash, which can involve the skin and mucous membranes, appears and spreads quickly. When 30% of the skin is, infect, is affected, it's called toxic epidermal necrosis, which is a life-threatening condition. If this develops, emergency medical care is needed. While rash can be linked with HIV or HIV medications, it's important to keep in mind that rashes are common and can have many other causes. So is, the question becomes, and I've heard this, is there a difference in symptoms when it comes to males and females? Symptoms of HIV vary from person to person, but they're similar in men and women. These symptoms can come and go or get progressively worse. If a person has been exposed to HIV, they may also have been exposed to other sexually transmitted infections, or STIs for short. These include gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, and trichomonas. Men and those with the penis may be more likely than women to notice symptoms of STIs, such as sores on their genitals, However, men typically don't seek medical care as often as women. And men, we have to change this. You guys' health are important. Now, HIV symptoms in women, is there a difference? For the most part, symptoms of HIV are similar in men and women. However, symptoms 
they experience overall may differ based on the different risks men and women face if they have HIV. Both men and women with HIV are at increased risk for STIs. However, women and those with a vagina may be less likely than men to notice small spots or other changes to their genitals. In addition, women with HIV are, are at increased risk for recurrent vaginal yeast infections, other vaginal infections including bacterial vaginosis, pelvic inflammatory disease, menstrual cycle changes, as well as the human papillomavirus, HPV for short, which can cause genital warts and lead to cervical cancer. While not related to HIV symptoms, another risk for women with HIV is that the virus can be transmitted to a baby during pregnancy. However, antiviral therapy is considered safe during pregnancy. Women who are treated with antiviral therapy are at a very low risk for transmitting HIV to their baby during pregnancy and delivery. Breastfeeding is also affected in women with HIV. The virus can be transferred to a baby through breast milk. In the United States and other settings where formula is accessible and safe, it's recommended that women with HIV not breastfeed their babies. For these women, use of formula is encouraged. Options besides formula include pasteurized banked human milk. For women who may have been exposed to HIV, it's important to know what symptoms to look for. What are the symptoms of AIDS? AIDS refers to acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. With this condition, the immune system is weakened due to HIV that's typically gone untreated for many years. If HIV is found and treated early with antiviral therapy, a person will usually not develop AIDS. People with HIV may develop AIDS if their HIV is not diagnosed until late or if they know they have HIV but don't consistently, consistently take their antiviral therapy. They may also develop AIDS if they have a type of HIV that's resistant to, which means doesn't respond to, the antiviral treatment. Without proper and consistent treatment, people living with HIV can develop AIDS sooner. By that time, the immune system is quite damaged and has a harder time generating a response to infection and disease. With the use of antiviral therapy, a person can maintain a chronic HIV diagnosis without developing AIDS for decades. So the symptoms? Well, the symptoms of AIDS can include recurrent fever, chronic swollen lymph glands, especially of the armpits, neck, and groin, chronic fatigue, night sweats, dark splotches under the skin or inside the mouth, nose, or eyelids, sore spots or lesions of the mouth and tongue, genitals, or anus, bumps, lesions, or rashes of the skin, recurrent or chronic diarrhea, rapid weight loss, Neurologic problems such as trouble concentrating, memory loss, and confusion, as well as anxiety and depression. Antiviral therapy controls the virus and usually prevents progression to AIDS. Other infections and complications of AIDS can also be treated. That treatment must be tailored to the individual needs of the person. So what other what are the options? What are the treatment options? Treatment should begin as soon as possible after a diagnosis of HIV, regardless of viral load. The main treatment for HIV is antiviral therapy, which is a combination of daily medications that stop the virus from reproducing. This helps protect CD4 cells keeping the immune system strong enough to take measures against disease. 
Antiviral therapy helps keep HIV from progressing to AIDS. It also helps reduce the risk of transmitting HIV to others. When treatment is effective, the viral load will be undetectable. The person still has HIV, but the virus is not visible in test results. However, the virus is still in the body. And if that person stops taking antiviral therapy, the viral load will increase again. And the HIV can again start attacking CD4 cells. So what medications do they have out there? Many antiviral therapy medications are approved to treat HIV. They work to prevent HIV from reproducing and destroying CD4 cells, which help the immune system generate a response to infection. This helps reduce the risk of developing complications related to HIV, as well as transmitting the virus to others. These antiviral medications are grouped into six classes, and they are nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, NRTIs for short, non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, NNRTIs for short, protease inhibitors, fusion inhibitors, CCR5 antagonists, also known as entry inhibitors, integrase stand transfer inhibitors. So there are some medications out there and those were the six classes of them. Now, treatment regimen. So how does that work? How does that go? The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, HHS for short, generally recommends a starting regimen of three HIV medications from at least two of these drug classes. This combination helps prevent HIV from forming resistance to medications. Many of the antiviral medications are combined with others so that a person with HIV typically takes only one or two pills a day. A healthcare provider will help a person with HIV choose a regimen based on their overall health and personal circumstances. These medications must be taken every day, exactly as prescribed. If they're not taken appropriately, viral resistance can develop and a new regimen may be needed. Blood testing will help determine if the regimen is working to keep the viral load down and the CD4 count up. If an antiviral therapy regimen isn't working, the person's healthcare provider will switch them to a different regimen that's more effective. So what are the side effects and well, the cost? Of course, that's a question most would have. The side effects of antiviral therapy vary and may include nausea, headache, and dizziness. These symptoms are often temporary and disappear with time. Serious side effects can include swelling of the mouth and tongue and liver or kidney damage. If side effects are severe, the medications can be adjusted. Costs for antiviral therapy vary according to geographic location and type of insurance coverage. Some pharmaceutical companies have assistance programs to help lower the cost. So how can we prevent even getting HIV? What's the prevention look like? Although many researchers are working to develop one, there's currently no vaccine available to prevent the transmission of HIV. However, taking certain steps can help prevent the transmission of HIV. Safer sex for one. The most common way for HIV to be transferred is through anal or vaginal sex without a condom or other barrier method. This risk can be completely eliminated unless sex is avoided entirely. But the risk can be lowered considerably by taking a few precautions. And just as many out there are concerned, a person concerned about their risk for HIV should get tested for HIV, it's important that they learn their status and that of their partner. 
get tested for other sexually transmitted infections. If they test positive for one, they should get it treated because having an STI increases the risk of contracting HIV. Condom use. They should learn the correct way to use condoms and use them every time they have sex, whether it's through vaginal or anal intercourse. It's important to keep in mind that preseminal fluids, which came out before male ejaculation, can contain HIV. Take their medications as directed if they have HIV. This lowers the risk of transmitting the virus to their sexual partners. So are there other methods? Yes, there are. Other prevention methods, other steps to help prevent the spread of HIV include avoid sharing needles or other paraphernalia. HIV is transmitted through blood and can be contracted by using materials that have come in contact with the blood of someone who has HIV. Consider PEP. A person who has been exposed to HIV should contact their healthcare provider about obtaining post-exposure prophylaxis, PEP. PEP can reduce the risk of contracting HIV. It consists of three antiviral medications given for 28 days. PEP should be started as soon as possible after exposure but before 36 to 72 hours have passed. You can also consider PrEP. A person has a higher chance of contracting HIV should talk to their healthcare provider about pre-exposure prophylaxis, PrEP. If taken consistently, it can lower the risk of acquiring HIV. PrEP is a combination of two drugs available in pill form. Healthcare providers can offer more information on these and other ways to prevent the spread of HIV. Living with HIV, what to expect and tips for coping. More than 1.2 million people in the United States are living with HIV. It's different for everybody, but with treatment, many can expect to live a long, productive life. The most important thing is to start antiviral treatment as soon as possible. By taking medications exactly as prescribed, people living with HIV can take their viral load low and their immune system strong. It's also important to follow up with the healthcare provider regularly. And other ways people living with HIV can improve their health include make their health their top priority. Steps to help people living with HIV feel their best include fueling their body with a well-balanced diet, exercising regularly, getting plenty of rest, as well as avoiding tobacco and other drugs. Reporting any new symptoms to the healthcare provider right away. Focus on their mental health. They could consider seeing a licensed therapist who is experienced in treating people with HIV. Use safer sex practices. Talk to their sexual partner or partners. Get tested for other STIs and use condoms and other barrier methods every time they have vaginal or anal sex. Talk to their healthcare provider about PrEP or PEP. Surround themselves with loved ones. Get support. There are many ways to get the most out of life when living with HIV. HIV life expectancy. Know the facts. In the 90s, a 20-year-old person with HIV had a 19-year life expectancy. But by 2011, a 20-year-old person with HIV could expect to live another 53 years. Of course, it is a dramatic improvement, but it's due in large part to antiviral therapy. With proper treatment, many people with HIV can expect a normal or near normal lifespan. Of course, many things affect life expectancy for a person with HIV. Among them are CD4 cell count, viral load, Serious HIV-related illnesses, including hepatitis, misusing drugs, smoking, access, adherence, and response to treatment, 
as well as other health conditions and age. Where a person lives also matters. People in the United States and other developed countries may be more likely to have access to antiviral therapy. Consistent use of these drugs helps prevent HIV from progressing to AIDS. When HIV advances to age, life expectancy without treatment is about three years. Life expectancy statistics are just general guidelines. People living with HIV should talk to their healthcare provider to learn more about what they can expect. Is there a vaccine? Currently, there are no vaccines to prevent or treat HIV. Of course, research and testing on experimental vaccines are ongoing, but none are close to being approved for general use. We have to all understand, HIV is a complicated virus. It mutates rapidly and is often able to fend off immune system responses. Only a small number of people who have HIV develop broadly neutralizing antibodies. The kind of antibodies that can respond to a range of HIV strains. So it's really important that we take the time to understand what HIV and AIDS are and to not continue to run with the misinformation and myths that are running rampant. And that's through social media, word of mouth. So it's just really important to know all the facts so you can make a good decision for yourself and your family. Yes, HIV is complicated. But there is help to sustain the lifespan. But the best thing to do is to use condoms and other things to take preventive measures. Strap up for sex. It's your best option. Or if you choose, not have sex at all. But who really wants to do, to do that? But it's up to every individual to take the proper steps necessary. And to really pay attention to our bodies and listen to our bodies. Because there are so many people out there who do have HIV and AIDS who know that they have it. Who refuse to take medication. And who choose to intentionally spread it. Which is not fair to anyone because it can be a death sentence for someone. And for the ones who are doing this, jail time is one that you will receive from knowingly spreading it. Because it is a death sentence. If a person doesn't know, and they're just going about their way not knowing anything. So if you have it, be honest. Let people know that you have it. Give people a fair shake. Give them the option in their own health to say, okay, I understand you have it, we'll use protection, or the other choice to say, no, I'm uncomfortable with that idea. It's only fair. So be fair to yourself and others and strap up and protect yourself. No matter how a person looks, looks can be deceiving. And you don't want to get caught up and have to live a life dealing with HIV. So be good to yourself and be good to others and be well. You have been listening to Old World Radio, the talk show podcast. This has been Let's Talk Daily Health, where daily health is as an ever-changing reality. If you would like to get in contact with On One Radio, the email is on one radio talk at gmail.com. Place it to the attention of David Hill. I have been your host, Tony Williams, and thank you for listening. For more, you can find me on YouTube. The name is Tony On One. You can find On One Radio on Facebook. 
on Warren's Day Watch, brought to you by Facebook Group, WordPress, Twitter, Instagram, Tumblr, all one radios out there.